As I was introduced, uh, I am the CEO for Cable Labs. I'll describe a little bit uh, more about that here in a minute. Uh, up till December of 11, most recently, I was the Chief Technology Officer at Hewlett Packard out in California. Uh, retired December of 11. Thought I was retiring. I'm not very good at retiring because that was actually my second retirement. Uh, and was uh, persuaded to come out of retirement to take the, uh, the CEO position at Kid Cable Labs. My background is in the wireless uh, mobile space from the uh, mid 80s. Um, up through uh, 96, 97, I went into the broadband industry and then ultimately uh, ended up at uh, the world's largest technology company uh, at, uh, at HP. Uh, my joining of HP is always a little bit of an interesting story. Carly Fiorina recruited me out of retirement to come to HP for one year to help her with the, uh, the compact merger. and. Uh, Ten years later, I finally achieved escape velocity and, uh, and exited. So I'll give you a little bit of background um, on some of my thinking on innovation. Originally, I was going to come and talk um, about what's called the seven laws of innovation. That's what the poster's about. There's a blog post that's out there, and uh, Business Week and Fast Company have all written on, on, my, on this thing that I wrote about the seven laws, but what I've asked, I've kind of changed the presentation here actually in the last 30 minutes uh, to uh, give you a little bit more background on cable labs, but more specifically to talk about kind of what is the future going to look like 10, 20 years out. Um, my background at HP, part of my role was to have kind of a 20 to 40 year vision for where technology trends were going to take us. Um, and so I was asked at the last minute to maybe kind of tweak the presentation a little bit and give you a little bit of insight, my personal insight, on what are some of these big changes and trends that are coming. How are they going to impact us? How are they going to impact you, not only as consumers, but also the opportunities they create for entrepreneurs? Um, where new businesses um, are going to be emerging, where there are investment opportunities, but also where are the big risks that are coming? When we think about innovation, there's two fundamental challenges for innovation. The fundamental challenges of innovation is the innovation gap and the innovation delay. The innovation gap, it's the lack of supply of really great ideas. We don't lack for ideas, right? We all probably have notebooks we're carrying around with literally hundreds of ideas. The question is, is what are the best two or three ideas? Really, ideas that are transformative, that transform companies, transform industries, transform you as a participant or the person who came up with that idea. Second is the innovation delay. From the time you identify that idea you're going to execute, how fast can you execute to get that onto the shelf? And what my lessons learned over the years is, is as organizations get larger, the challenge of having really great ideas that have impact and getting those ideas implemented becomes even a larger challenge. This is the distinct advantage of entrepreneurs. In fact, if you looked at, there's an SBA uh, study from the Small Business Administration looking at innovation coming from small businesses. And the way they measure innovation is what they call high impact patents. Small businesses that filed patents that were high impact. And the way you measure high impact is a small business has a patent and a bunch of other patents all point to it. They refer to it as prior art. They report, re list it as being something fundamental in the industry and that their patent actually builds on top of it. What's interesting with the SBA study is, is that you are eight times more likely to have a fundamental patent come from a small business rather than a multi-global national. Eight times more likely to have a fundamental patent come from a small business. And in fact, most medium to larger businesses have shifted their innovation strategy to an innovation by M&A. Buy the innovation. Acquire companies. Acquire the individuals that have those ideas which makes now the perfect time for entrepreneurs 
to come up with those ideas, to get into the market, to come up with those things that are transformative. Because the large businesses suffer from this innovation, innovation gap and this innovation delay. It's those small businesses that stay focused, identify those new opportunities, push hard, that succeed and win in this game of M&A by M&A. So, our vision at Cable Labs, if you don't know, Cable Labs is like either the, west, the worst or best kept secret of the cable industry. We've been around for 25 years, started off headquartered in Boulder, we're now headquartered in Louisville. We are 184, 185 employees, another 30 consultants. Of those 185, 110, 115 are engineers. Our sole purpose every day is to invent. The way I describe it is, is that we're the Bell Labs, the Bell Labs of the 60s for the cable industry. More than 60% of all U.S. homes have at least one cable labs technology in your house. If you have high-speed data provided by Comcast, as an example, go to where your cable modem is setting, pick it up, turn it over, look at the bottom, and you'll see the Cable Labs logo. Cable Labs invented the technology called DOCSIS, which is the fundamental technology for high-speed data. If you get your phone service from your cable operator, that's based on a technology called packet cable. That was invented at Cable Labs. So our sole purpose every day is to invent. Our mission is really to deliver the innovations that allow our members to be the provider of choice in the markets they serve. Our members are the cable operators. We are funded as a percentage of revenue from those members. Right? So I, probably, I have probably one of the easiest sales and marketing jobs out there. Because I don't need to do any sales and marketing. Because I get a check mailed every quarter from the cable operators as a percentage of their revenue and that's what funds our R&D for Cable Labs. Cable Labs has three priorities. One is speed, the next is focus, third is innovation. Cable Labs has been around for 25 years. When I was recruited, when the CEOs who make up the board of directors at Cable Labs approached me to come out of retirement, Cable Labs had a history of being very slow. Like, they would start a project and it would be five, six, seven, ten, fifteen years to take an idea and deliver it into the marketplace. Right? In fact, Doxis, the current version that's deployed in most homes around the world is based on Doxis 3.0. If you look at each subsequent generation of Doxis, it's four and a half to five years each generation. Me coming from Silicon Valley, that's three Moore's Law cycles. You're roadkill. That's slow. So in fact, DOCSIS 3.1, which we announced last year, which will start being deployed next year, this is the version of cable that will get you up to 10 gigabits download speed to your home over your existing network that you already have coming into your house. We will deliver that in two years, start to finish, of which the if, you read any, if you're in the cable industry, you probably have read all the trade press. I've had every reporter call me every name in the book. I'm insane. Here's the nutcase from Silicon Valley. Well, never. He just doesn't know the cable industry. It takes time. We're going to deliver it in two years. And we're, in fact, we're slightly ahead of schedule. The other is focus. We live in an idea-rich environment, whether you're in the cable industry, broadband, telecom, software, mobile apps, right? There's lots of ideas. Cable apps, no different. In fact, when I joined Cable Labs, at that time we were about 170 employees, about 90 engineers. This is two years ago. So think about that, 90 engineers Cable Labs was working on 69 projects. How does that work? work. 90 engineers, 69 projects. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. You, got the, you, you got the peanut butter effect. You're time slicing everybody so small, you can't move any one project fast enough. So we, re, we cut almost two thirds of the projects out, killed projects. And to be quite honest, killing projects is the hardest thing you will ever do if you're in the innovation game. 
We all get emotionally tied to projects. We love our projects. We want to make sure this is, this is it. This is going to be the thing. In fact, at HP, I would jokingly refer to projects at HP as that we never kill them. We wound them. <laughs> and amazingly, two years later, this project would all of a sudden pop back up. And I'm like, I swore we killed it. Well, some engineer kind of slumps it over in the corner and they're doing CPR on it. They're going to keep it alive. Projects that are kind of languishing around are opportunity costs. Two arms, two legs, limited amount of resources. Focus is your best friend from the standpoint of how do you make success on innovation. The other is innovation. Cable Labs historically has been very much of a reactionary organization. Wait for the phone call from one of the people who fund us to say, hey, go work on Project X, and everybody runs away. In fact, I started in my early days at Cable Labs referred to it as waiting for the bat phone to ring. We had to get out of the mode of waiting for the phone to ring. We needed to take thought leadership roles and provide thought leadership to the industry. Well, in fact, I think I said it so much that they finally got a little annoyed with it. So what did they do? They went out and bought me my own bat phone. <laughs> so it actually sits on my desk. It does flash red when you call my number. Um, but it, but it, my message to this team was is, is success and innovation is having a vision. Believing in that vision, telling the story of that vision. If you wait to just simply be tactical and respond, you're behind the curve. Innovation is all about being in front, not being behind. One of the other things I did early on in Cable Labs is, is we committed to Silicon Valley. Now, a lot of people, in fact, there's been rumors in the press that the only reason Cable Labs is in Silicon Valley is because I live there. Well, let me correct everybody's perspective on that. I live in Colorado. <laughs> All right, I've sold my house. I bought 35 acres between Longmont and Berthoud. And my wife has fallen in love with Colorado, and she has made it quite clear she ain't leaving. The roots are deep, okay? But from the standpoint of the work that we do, particularly in trying to get the startup community to think about the cable industry as a great platform to innovate on top of, you gotta be where they're at. And the two best places in the world to be, Silicon Valley and Colorado. And that's why we built our roots here. So the lower picture is our new 18,000 square foot facility in Sunnyvale. We have the first floor. Twitter has the second floor. So if you know anything about Silicon Valley, Twitter prides itself on being a city, comp what they call a city company, headquartered in San Francisco. This is their token office in Silicon Valley. So we have Twitter upstairs. We have the first floor. In that facility, we, do, we have R&D labs. We have uh, equipment. Uh, we have staff there. We have staff that works in the venture community, um, evaluating vent potential uh, funding options. Um, we also have development labs where we give free lab space to startup companies who are working in the areas of media, technology, things that could take advantage of uh, the cable industry space. So if you know of companies or are potentially interested or just want to stop by and see the facilities in, uh, in California, feel free. It's uh, one block off of uh, downtown Sunnyvale. When I joined Cable Labs two years ago, Cable Labs was primarily focused in the U.S. We had 38 members, primarily North America, uh, and can that included U.S. and Canada. We had a couple in Europe, we had one in Singapore, and we had one in Latin America. And this was June of 12 when I joined. Those 38 members that make up Cable Labs covered about 80 million subscribers around the world. Part of the strategy that I brought in coming in over the last uh, 18 months is to drive an international and global strategy. What's interesting is, is the cable industry is very much aligned from a technology perspective globally. So it's not like, okay, the U.S. is on one standard and Europe is on a different standard. The, the globally, we've aligned. So we've gone, and this was August of 1351 members. Actually, as of today, we're 59 members. 
Um, that includes now, we pretty much have, and this is way behind because we have now 19 members in Europe. We actually took over an organization called Cable Europe Labs. It was modeled after Cable Labs. They had a staff of three. <laughs> they basically took the output work of Cable Labs and then used them in Europe. Um, all of our work is public. You can go onto Cable Labs. You can download all of our R&D um, and take advantage of that, and that's what the Europeans did. So we acquired Cable Europe Labs and therefore brought all those members in. In addition, we brought in what started off as our first two members in China. We actually now have six members in China. China is a little bit of an interesting beast, right? Um, right now, in fact, in China, if you're a U.S. technology company or you're perceived as a U.S. technology company, you basically get stiff-armed. Uh, you very hard to sell anything in China at this point. Uh, this was a little, taking advantage of a little bit of my experience at HP. Um, a lot of people didn't realize, but HP was the first company to be granted a license by the Chinese to actually build a facility and manufacture in China. David Packard was served as Deputy Secretary of Defense in the Nixon administration, built relationships with China, and that parlayed it. So I had the advantage of building great relationships with the Chinese when I was as part of HP. I took advantage of that coming to Cable Labs. We actually successfully have completed our negotiations with China and Europe. They each had slightly different versions of DOCSIS as an example. We would develop DOCSIS. European had a Euro DOCSIS. And China, like usual, would do C DOCSIS. Right? So we had three different versions. Not good for the industry because that meant vendors had to build three different versions. With us taking over Cable Europe Labs and getting the European members aligned, we successfully completed negotiations with the Chinese government, including SARFT, which is the regulators that regulate broadband services in China, to do two amazing things. One is, is SARFT gave CDOCs back to Cable Labs, and they signed their contributors agreement, which meant all of the patents and intellectual property that the Chinese put into China Doxis is now part of the patent pools at Cable Labs. So now, with the next generation of our technology, it's one global standard worldwide, which now creates a phenomenal market opportunity for the vendors, but also companies who build and innovate on top of our technologies, who create new products and services, because now you have a global market opportunity. So 59 members now, this is 120 million subscribers, and that's actually about 175 million subscribers now. And just to put it in context, so 50, you know, 0.9 million um, subscribers, video subscribers in the US, and we cover about 92, 93% of all video subscribers in the US, make up that 50.9. China alone has 330 million video subscribers. So just to, just to put it in context of scale and size. When I'm looking for new opportunities to innovate, the one key factor that I look for is complexity. Because where there's complexity, that's opportunity. When there's lots of new things going on, when there's no kind of winner been selected, a lot of different options, a lot of ambiguity, that's the opportunity to innovate. So one is, is device complexity, right? We think about devices in the context of computers or mobile phones, but now with the advent of sensors, you know, if you've seen, you know, the Kickstarter campaign on the tags, little white tags that have GPS, Bluetooth, you can attach them to your luggage. So if uh, United lose your baggage and they can't tell you where you're at, you can actually dial your bag and it'll tell you where it's at. <laughs> Um, but you start thinking about all of these kinds of new, whether it's machinery, home appliances, pallets and cases, tracking just the shipping mechanisms, consumer items, 10 to the 12th. So what today we think is, oh my God, we've got this explosive market in computers, laptops, PCs, and in mobile phones, it's a drop in the bucket to what's coming. Huge opportunities very complex problems to solve 
but great from the standpoint of growth opportunities. The other is complexity of networks. Now this is an actual photograph that I took um, years ago. I, spent, I was uh, based in Hong Kong um, with one of the companies I was uh, part of. And this is, if you're familiar with, with uh, Hong Kong, you take the ferries over to Kowloon, stand in the alleyways, look up, snap, take the picture. They, their whole idea of a network is, is some one member or some person in the block buys broadband, then they put their own router in, and then they literally are hand stringing cables across the alleyways <laughs> and sharing the one connection. You know, India's even worse because they'll do that and then they throw it up across the metal roofs and uh, not good from the standpoint of like lightning storms and those kinds of things. But the, the, the complexity of the network, you know, the, the availability of services, right? The ever growing need of new kinds of services. Today, in the case of cable and broadband, it's the leading provider of broadband services in the United States. But if you look at the growth rate of how much speed, how much capacity consumers are using, any given day, roughly 55 to 60 percent of all internet traffic is Netflix and YouTube. Not Netflix-like companies or YouTube-like companies. YouTube and Netflix. 50%. 50, 55 to 60 percent of all internet traffic today is Netflix and YouTube. And it's growing. We all like that binge watching, right? We're going to catch up on that TV show and watch, you know, spend a whole, whole weekend in our pajamas on the couch catching up on our favorite show that we missed through the rest of the year, right? That's just in the U.S. That's U.S. Europe is actually less from the standpoint of those companies. But even if you look at um, in China, right, you got to do a little bit of a comparison. The average broadband speed for consumers in the U.S. here today is about 30 megabits, kind of the middle of the bell curve. you got less. You know, now we've got here in the U.S. you can get 300 meg services from Comcast, and Time Warner, Suddenlink just announced that Cox has got uh, 300 meg services. But those are kind of really thin part of the business, right? 30 megs is kind of the middle. China, the middle of the bell curve is 3 meg, right? So broadband is not evenly distributed around the world, which makes it a little bit challenging if you want to create products and services that takes advantage of broadband services. You have to be aware and know and think about what some of those trends are that are going on around it. Well, South Korea, in, in the case of MDUs, here's an interesting statistic, right? You know, everybody likes to publish the top 10 countries from broadband services, and then you get everybody pounding the table. Oh my God, the cable guys, you, you, know, you were terrible, you suck, you know, it's so bad, right? If you took the United States, all 50 states, and you treat them as countries, right? So New York is a country, Virginia is a country. When you think about the population, it's about the correct correlation. Now list the top 10 countries, seven of them would be the United States. The challenge you have is, is when you look at it from a U.S. as a peanut butter across the U.S., sorry, some parts of rural Montana, kind of hard to reach with broadband services. But if you think about the 50 states of the U.S., treat them as countries, seven of the top 10 fastest, quote, countries would be in the United States by states. What out of three? What's that? Oh, the other three. You said seven, out of seven out of 10. What are the non-U.S.? Oh, the non-U.S.? Uh, 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 Finland? Uh, Korea? I don't think Holland's number three anymore. I think Singapore now is number three. They all tend to be fairly small geographically. Now, I will tell you, in Pusan, I spent a fair amount of time in Pusan, Korea. This was years ago. It has, like, unbelievable speed in the hotel. In fact, I was tempted to call the office when I was at HP and just say, hey, just ship my mail here. You know, I can have better performance than I could have in my house. But it's unevenly distributed. Multi-dwelling units, apartments, high concentration of people living in cores, easy to deliver, high speed. Dispersed rural areas, 
much harder. My wife and I have a, a small venture fund that we make investments. It's an impact fund. So we make investments for long-term investments, and we're invested. Uh, biggest part of our investments in Rwanda, and I've been working with President Kagame and his administration on broadband services to Rwanda. It's not known as the country of a thousand hills, just as kind of a, just a name. Try building broadband services in a country like that. Is a, and, and to get broadband services to schools, hospitals, government facilities, right? My personal passion is that we need to solve the broadband reach globally because that's the biggest way we can impact the, the economy of an area, whether it's a rural area in the U.S. or overseas. Complexity of experience, right? How many different devices do you carry with you? How many of those devices you carry with you both in your home and at work? Now this is heresy, you know, five, ten years ago, right? You had your work devices and then you had your personal devices, right? And then we had this BYOD initiative, you know, bring your own device. You now can pick your own laptop and it can be your, both your personal laptop and your work laptop. You can have one mobile phone and get your personal email and your work email. This integration of these experiences become more complex and consumers have an insatiable appetite for the new and shiny, right? Everyone wants the new shiny thing, whatever it is. And then complexity of vision. This is my number one challenge at Cable Labs. I've got 59 members. I have 14 of the CEOs of the largest cable operators on my board. Neil Smith, CEO for Comcast. Rob Marcus, CEO for Time Warner. Tom Rutledge, CEO for Charter. Pat Esser, CEO for Cox. All make up my board. Try to get an industry to align on a vision. Everybody's got their own different perspectives. How do you get consensus? How do you get alignment? How do, you, how do you build up enough credibility to be able to provide a thought leadership role that people will follow? I do it from the standpoint of, I have to from the standpoint of cable apps, but this is a key skill for any innovator, right? Going it alone, your odds of success is pretty slim. Your ability to attract others to your vision becomes critical to success. So to talk about, I spent, a lot, I spent a lot of time in my career, particularly all my years at HP, looking at the future. You know, what is five years out? What is 10 years out? What is 20 years out look like? And a lot of people always ask, you know, how's, how in the heck do you do 20 years in the future? Well, it's real easy because the odds are none of you are going to be in this room 20 years from now to call me on it, right? <laughs> but... Um, there, there are ways for you to at least think about what are some of the fundamental technologies that are shifting. The way I look back is also to kind of give myself context. What did 10 years back look like? Now I'm going to apologize because I just pulled this deck out 30 minutes ago. So now you have to kind of transport yourself to 2013, not 2014, okay? So 10 years ago, we had the, uh, the Challenger explosion. Wired Magazine on its front cover really was projecting Wi-Fi to be the next thing. And everybody told Wired that they were totally bogus and didn't know what they were talking about. Right? The very first cameras, um, Steve announcing iTunes. Think about it. Ten years ago, there was no such thing as iTunes. Right? In California, we had uh, Arnold, who became our governor. And then we had Second Life. How many of you remember Second Life when it was the big thing? How many of you are still on Second Life? If you're still on Second Life, it means you have no social life. <laughs> you think about it today, this is 13, but it actually can still play out today. You, we've got uh, you know, smart devices, whether it be things like Metal Watch or Pebble. Um, you know, you've got SpaceX. Who would ever have thought 10 years ago that, that in 2013 we'd have a private company successfully launching resupply ships to the International Space Station? We'd always thought it had to be government funded. It was too risky. No private business would ever innovate in a way that would allow that to be a successful business. And we have SpaceX. 
we got the Google Glass piece. We've got the WikiLeaks, which continues to be the ongoing. So fast forward, what does 10 years in the future look like? And this is just a couple of different uh, sample ideas that uh, I've been working on or I've uh, been involved in. Actually, I'm going to start with memory spot. You can barely see that little um, square in the middle. It's in, it's in the middle between the pencil dots. It's a little bitty square. In fact, come up, you can come up afterwards and you can take a look, but you can see the little copper dot in the upper corner. Probably can't see it all that well in the back, right? This is memory spot. Memory spot, 256 meg of memory, requires no battery. It uses magnetic resonance. You stimulate the device and it actually emits it bits. So when you stimulate it, it actually sends out a stream of bits, which is the content stored on the memory spot. It looks like a normal file system. You can put a JPEG image on it. You can put an audio in it. You can put a movie on it. And in fact, this is one from uh, some researchers where they put a memory spot on it. You really can't see it because of the color. But it was a researcher who took a picture of his son. And on the memory spot is the audio file of what the son was singing at that time. And he was singing a little song into the little recorder in his hand. Memory spot was part of some work that we also did. If you've been following things, for instance, in the case of Disney, with the new armbands that you can wear and you can walk through the turnstiles. That was work done by my innovation program office at HP using memory spots. So you can store the memory, you can write to it, you can read from it. The uh, VA is looking at using it for medical records, using it on dog tags. So now you can store a lot more information right there when you need it, when someone needs that kind of information. This is kind of phase one for a new kind of technology, which is high density memory, very, very low power. There's no battery on this. Very durable. You can use it every day. It doesn't wear out. If you've seen, there's been a, uh, a recent article that just came out around a new memory technology called MemRister, uh, which is, again, memory that you would use in a computer that requires no no battery, but it operates just as fast as the memory in your PC. It will replace all hard drives and it will replace the core memory in your PC. So there will be no concept of spinning media going forward. Very, very low cost. Memory, Memrister was kind of the initiative of that. So when you think about today, how much memory you can store in a device, the current trend lines with Memrister and uh, you know, the uh, memory spot technologies is, in an iPhone this big over the next five to six years, you'll be able to have upwards between eight and 10 terabytes in your iPhone. So what do you do when you have 10 terabytes in your iPhone? Get arrested at the border. <laughs> <laughs> but think about it from like standpoint of your DVR. Right, I think about it from a cable industry perspective. Right, your DVR stays at home, stores all the shows you have on it, but that's kind of a family DVR. It's got some of your favorite shows, your kids' favorite shows, your spouse' favorite shows, and then at night it's the arm wrestle as to who's gonna give to watch the show, or you gotta find the one show you both like. Think about it now that your DVR literally is the device you have in your pocket. If you're sitting in your living room, it's playing it off this device. You're in a hotel room, it's playing off of this device. You literally can carry every bit of content with you all the time. Now, what's the challenge of that? I've got great compute capability, now I've got great storage. What's the limitation on this device to really become the ultimate computing platform? The connection. Bandwidth is one, the other is? Screen size, right? And so, you know, we've got the iPads and those kinds of devices that are coming out. This image here is an image of flexible display, which I've got a sample here. You can come up afterwards and take a look. Flexible display 
is literally a mylar film. It's the same mylar film that is used for flexible solar panels. So if you see the military roll these things out on the desert, this is the mylar film. Modify that mylar film and you can literally print the electronics directly onto the, the, the mylar film. In this case, these are little square test displays. Now, what is, what's really interesting is people go, oh, you can fold this, stick it in your pocket. Now, I mean, you can look at all the dings and nicks and all that. You still have a lot of work to do for the underlying material. However, what is really the advantage of this is even at today's limited ability to manufacture this, I can produce this today for about one-third the cost of an LCD panel. Same size, same resolution for one-third the cost. I get this to be one-tenth the cost of an LCD panel. Where do I put this? Everywhere. Every flat surface. Tabletops, the walls, every place you're walking down in, you know, you go shopping, everything is a digital display. So if I put this everywhere, I've got my 10 terabytes, I got my connectivity in here, now I can take advantage of this display. So literally, whatever you carry in your pocket becomes your complete computing platform. It does everything for you. It's got the compute capability, it's got your storage capability, you take advantage of what I call universal resources, these kinds of devices that are just generally available because they're so cheap, they're prolific everywhere. So you literally can walk up to a wall, standing in a lobby area and hurry up and get some work done and then walk away. You can sit at a tabletop, this becomes your display. Totally transforms the concept of what is a computer going to look like, you know, five to ten years from now. Some other things that are interesting in here, one is, is is areas around tactile displays. What's the problem with touch displays today on glass? You get no feedback, right? How many of you have to cheat and look at the glass to know exactly where you're putting the finger so you don't mistype? Is it autocorrect great? Yes. Right? I mean, it makes for great comedy. It makes for very embarrassing messages if you don't go back and reread it. This is work around giving you tactical feedback on touch display technologies. One of the interesting characteristics around touch displays is, is I can make you think you're touching a button and it's smooth glass. The way you do that is you call what's called resonate the glass. You literally shift and shake the glass opposite to the orientation of the finger. So if I'm pointing at a glass, and I resonate that glass going in the direction, at certain frequencies, you will swear you're touching a button. You can feel the edge of the button, you can feel the top of the button, you can feel the side of the button. There's no button. So this is work that's underway at universities and a lot of other, a lot of uh, corporate labs in trying to solve the touch problem. How do I take advantage of touch displays, but that make you feel like you've got a keyboard, that allow you to really have true tactile interaction with your device rather than this cold glass touch kind of, a, kind of a feel that you have to it. Trying to be sensitive to time to leave time. So real quick, these are what we call the mega trends for the cable industry. These are the 11 things Cable Labs is focused on. Okay? And by the way, you don't need to write these all down. If you want to copy the slides, just drop me your business card and I'll, uh, I'll send you the slides. Uh, there's nothing in here that's hidden or private or whatever. All IP. Cable network is moving to an all IP network. It may be 5, 10, 15 years depending on the cable operator. The network is already shifting from being what I would call a traditional cable network to going to an all IP network. What's IP? Inter Internet protocols, the I packets. Know, I know, but what, how is that different than the present? Well, today it's a proprietary network built specifically to transmit uh, video signals over coax. It's only used by the cable industry. So what you're going to have is your videos are no longer going to come over what we call QAM-based delivery, which is frequency. 
and it's going to come across as packets. So now you can get that, you know, today you're already experiencing it. If you use your, your, your iPad to get to watch ESPN, to watch uh, FIFA, right, World Cup, you're getting that as a packet. So you're going to have the situation where you're seeing this transition, you're seeing it already. This is a big change for the cable industry. It's, it's transitioning things that have been done for the last 40 years and moving to be more aligned with where the internet industry is and where those investments are going. Smart spaces, it's all about sensors. Many of our members already do home security, right? That's putting sensors in your house, video cameras, motion detectors, um, heat, smoke detectors, those types of things. Sensors are going to be the explosion. As I talked before about complexity of devices, it's those sensors, those little devices that get bedded in your home, get embedded in your office, get embedded on your person, that those are transformative on what you can do. I did one experiment when I was still based in California. I took a little sensor called Richter. It's used by the oil and gas industry. They basically throw these out onto the ground and they do the thump test to do the geo feedback from what's underneath the ground. I took one of those and I mount, set it on the edge of my granite countertop in my house in San Jose and then started reading the data coming from the sensor. It was so accurate I could see cars going down my street because of the vibration of a car on the pavement coming up over the curb, up my driveway, shaking the foundation of my house, the sensor would detect it. And the sensor could also detect that somebody else is in the house and which room they were walking around in. So you start thinking about taking that kind of data, what do you do with it? What could you do? What kind of decisions could you make? What kind of applications that don't exist today could exist? Identity management and security. Security, big issue, right? We all got kind of that, you know, little shock and awe when the, the, when the whole thing happened to Target and the stealing of all the credit card data, right? Yep. Here's my prediction. My prediction is, is that between, in the over, sometime over the next 10 years, we will have, all of us in this room will experience a cyber attack that is 10 times worse Target. And if you're not worried about it, personally, you should be. And if you're in an industry or you're working on technologies in that area, that's where the investments are going to be made. This stuff, this, the things that are coming out in this space, absolutely will curl your hair. Mm -hmm. And it's a big area for us. And in fact, many of you don't realize it, but every device that a cable operator provides you your set-top box, your cable modem, the, access, the wireless access point, if it comes from the cable operator, is all what we call a secured device. It has private key encryption embedded in that device. We know the physical address of where that device is. In fact, the cable industry operates the only secured network out there. And in fact, now other industries want to use that network, such as smart grids. We now provide, Cable Labs is working with the smart grid industry to do the same security model for, med, for protecting your smart meters on the side of your house, all of that network is part of the process. So you're telling us how the cyber attacks are happening, how is the prevention happening? Well, the problem is, is this is the security industry, and I'm going to be fully, fully disclosed here. Let's see, this would be in 1983, 84, I was doing work for NSA. So just full transparency, so I come from a little bit of that background two years and decided this was not the career for me. Um, but in the NSA, what we refer to as lock and lock pick problem. You build a better lock, they build a better lock pick. You build a better lock, they build a better lock pick. It is, it, this is a never ending problem. It is just inherently an ongoing. The way to deal with it is really what we call identity management. How do you authenticate people getting onto the network? How do I know you're trusted? And if you're trusted, and I know some other people, maybe I'll let them on the network, but they're not trusted, so I'm going to restrict them. So it's the ability to use unique ways of using identity management to know who is a good person versus who's maybe not a good person. And then how do you manage that? Today in the internet space, you don't really have a way of knowing identity, right? If you don't have a Facebook page, I can log on and put a Facebook page in your name and post your photo on it. 
you know, and say all kinds of things and ruin your chances of getting hired. And there's no way for you to know who I am and whether or not I did it or somebody else did it, right? Identity has no meaning today on the internet. It's one of those things that need to change. Pervasive wireless, Wi-Fi, critically important. Cable Labs, we just successfully petitioned the FCC to get more spectrum. So now, in fact, we just showed now being able to get three gigabits of speed on Wi-Fi in your home. And that's where we're going. Higher speeds, more wireless. Better pipes, multi-gigabit networks. Future of work. What does a company look like 10 years from now? Do we all go to the, do we all go to the office? Right? Are we all employees or are we all contractors? They all come together for a project, do the project, and then we all disperse. <coughs> right? Kind of like Hollywood. Hollywood, they all come together, they go do a movie. When the movie's done, they all disperse, they all go work on the next movie. So what is the future of work? What's the future of the enterprise? Companies. Why do companies exist? Right? If we're all going to work remotely, what's some of those things you need to have to be effective in work? Transformation of the content ecosystem. You're getting content from everywhere, whether it's Netflix, Amazon, YouTube, you know, personal content you're sharing with your kids. In my case, content that my kids send me for my grandkids, right? It's the whole, what, what is the definition of content? God help us, I hope it's not another 10 years of uh, being overloaded with cat videos. You know, I would hope it's something a little bit more meaningful. But think about just the change of content around education, right? You got Khan Academy, you got Udemy, you got all these services now of ways to learn and be educated. What's the role of that content? So think, you know, content on a broader scale. Rich user experiences, carrying your content with you, whether it's on your iPad or your iPhone. Software, software's where it's at. The hardware's commodity these days, right? Big thing for me to say, given I'm XHP and I still own my shares in HP, um, but hardware's a commodity. The differentiator's in the software for most platforms. Hard to do a watch on commodity hardware. You still need to do some hardware. But software is really where that competitive advantage is at. Radically changing economics. This is one of my personal projects that we have going on at Cable Labs. Today, we have entire segments of the population in the US and in around the world that cannot get broadband services, not because we can't build out the network and reach them, but that it's too expensive to deliver that service to them. Televisa, one of our members in Mexico, they're the largest producer of Spanish language content in the world. Phenomenal company. They've acquired a bunch of the cable operators. And this is one of the projects that I'm working with Tony Rallo, the CTO at Televisa, to look at is how do we take what today, a cable modem that you can go buy at Best Buy. So if you don't want to pay your rental charge, you can go buy your Doxus modem. Buy a Motorola, buy, buy one of them. But a cable modem today is anywhere from $50 to $75, right? $50 to $75 in some parts of the world is just beyond anybody's ability to even pay just for the device. And, that's a, and the devices used to be three to $400 15 years ago, right? So $50 to $75. Our design target is less than $5. So this isn't taking it from 50 to 40 to 35. One step, 50 to five. Because if I can deliver that for $5, the opportunity to deliver broadband to entire segments of the population that can't get broadband today opens up, both here in the U.S. and all around the world. So this is one of my, that's one of my, uh, I'm passionate about a lot of things. That's one of my personal passions. And then the measurement revolution, right? How do you use data to make better decisions, right? Now, generally, the population gets really nervous thinking about that the cable industry watches what you do, right? I'm still amazed when the industry does surveys how many people believe that the cable industry has somehow hidden a little camera into the front of your set-top box and records everything you do. Oh, let me just spell that. It is not the case, right? Okay? But the fact of the matter is, is today all of your data is getting analyzed from across the Internet, right? 
The one thing I, you know, just to kind of keep it in context, keep it in mind is, is that if you're using the service for free, meaning you're not being charged for it, Google, Facebook, LinkedIn, you are the product. You are trading your data in exchange for the free service. So you are the product. And you're paying for that product through the data. Now, many of you would say, hey, that's great because I get personalized services, I get better ads from Google, I log on to Amazon, it knows exactly what I purchased, it gives me a recommendation engine of books and things that I may like. Just in context, you're, you're trading your data for those kinds of experiences. And there's other kinds of services. Look at Netflix. They make recommendations based on the TV shows you watch. Analytics across the entire industry is becoming increasingly important. And a big area of which it's very hard to find good employees who know analytics. Whether it's web analytics, online marketing statistics, it's very, very hard to find good people. Now all of this is all high risk. No guarantee that uh, any of this is going to turn out, that any of it's going to be successful. It's a little bit of playing the, uh, the, 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 a little bit of a game, right? You know, one out of 10, two out of 10, three out of 10 going to make it, right? These are all active areas that we're focused on, but still all of them inherently high risk. Our target at Cable Labs is, is to have one out of 10 projects materialize and have an impact on the industry. One out of 10 is our target, which means we have a 90% kill rate, <laughs> right? And if you're part of any size organization, ask yourself what your kill rate is. Most people, their kill rate is, oh, we, we kill off 10% of our projects and they're really proud of it. And I look at them saying, you're, you're measuring it the wrong way. Because that means you got a, a lot of mediocre projects. You're not making the big bet that's going to transform yourself. One of the key things I've learned over the years on innovation, and this is even more so in the cable industry, is innovation through the ecosystem. No one individual, no one company can make it happen all on their own. HP, 320,000 employees, 47,000 engineers, 350 PhD researchers in R&D, four and a half billion dollars of R&D spend. Wow, lots of resources. I didn't lack for resources. But even in that case, HP couldn't deliver products without the ecosystem. In the case of PCs, it took HP's manufacturing, supply chain logistics, Intel processors, Microsoft operating system. The days of thinking that you can be, you can control it all, you can do it all with inside is long gone. You gotta, it's all about the success of building that ecosystem that drives long-term success for your innovation ideas. <sighs> okay. <laughs> so I'm done. I'm going to open it up for questions. So. Anybody have a couple questions? Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, how about encryption for all the data, for all the smart space, et cetera, et cetera? You know, there have to be some kind of security built in. Mm -hmm. What are the innovation when it comes to a personal and global encryption? Well, what you're seeing now is, is more and more of the devices, either personal devices, your phone, all the way through your routers, through the backbone networks. Encryption is getting rolled out, particularly with the Snowden NSA piece, right? Um, you know, Google now is encrypting everything between its data centers. Before it didn't. It would actually, if it had two Google data centers, they would transmit data unencrypted. Um, so you're seeing more and more of encryption literally being embedded in, um, in the device itself. What you have, though, historically in enterprise products, which is different than consumer products. So if you had an enterprise uh, laptop, in fact, uh, well, this is an Elite, this is a, a Leapbook folio. Um, but if you got like an HP or a Dell or a Lenovo uh, touchpad, uh, what you have are uh, the Lenovo products. What you have embedded in the enterprise products is a little chip called a TCP, Trusted Computing Platform. And the TCP enhances the encryption of everything stored on that enterprise device and everything that that device sends out. 
So this is something that the enterprise market has embraced for quite some time as part of its hand-to-hand -hand security, but that technology is not today available in the consumer segments. So you're going to start seeing more and more of these kinds of things that's so literally from the time it hits that device to, to it being stored, to it coming off that device, going across the wireless network, to going to uh, across the backbone to whatever the service is going to be. Everything is moving to that kind of an encryption model. Um, and even then, you have to have a little bit of trust, right? You think it's secure, right? You thought everything at Google was secure, but then when Snowden released the documents, he pointed out that the NSA was still able to read your Gmail because when Google synchronizes, you know, you send and store an email on this server, and it says, oh, we're going to make a backup copy, but I'm going to send it to this server in a different data center. I'm going to send it across the fiber link. When they sent it between two data centers, they didn't bother to encrypt it. And that's how you could watch. And so part of this is you can do a lot yourself, but it's also about setting and, and having a little bit of trust. NIST, the National Institute Standards Lab for the US government, is now working to define what they call frameworks by industry segments, security frameworks. Um, we're part of that. We were doing the effort for the broadband industry, Cable Labs is. But setting frameworks, setting best practices, kind of setting, you know, when you say you're secure, you're kind of going to, yep, we're doing it. We're doing, the, we're doing all of these things to uh, protect data. But it's still a work in progress across a wide range of industries, devices to servers to data centers. How do you secure all of that? Yes? You said right now you're a couple things. One is, is actually in March, we actually showed a prototype of what we call a virtualized modem. So a modem today is about this big. It's got a chip on it and a bunch of software, connectors and everything. We actually then uh, did what we call network function virtualization, which is basically take it down to the minimal chip and everything runs into the cloud. So your parental controls, your routing, nothing happens in that box. It all goes back to the cloud and then drops on. So therefore, all that software that I got to build to work on that device, all that R&D expense, the cost of that device, I can literally shrink down as far as possible. And this was a joint project between uh, Cable Labs, Cox, and Cisco. And we did it as what we call a co-innovation project. And we actually demonstrated it at March um, in Atlanta at what Cable Labs calls our March uh, Winter Conference. So we're on the path, it's not a product. We showed the concept, we showed that it'll work. And in fact, we did it on a $35 Raspberry Pi. We went down to radio, I sent, you know, sent the guy to go to a Radio Shack, buy a Raspberry Pi, and your job is to make it work on a Raspberry Pi. And they made it work. Yes? Yeah, well, with all the talk about digitization, uh, what's healthcare, what's healthcare gonna look like on that platform? Do you have any plans in place? What are the big trends? On healthcare? Ooh. Well, I think one is, is home health is becoming just an absolutely explosive area, right? So the ability to allow people to age in place. So part of the work that we're doing is, is smart sensors in the home, right? So things like uh, motion detectors. You know, my grandmother's 97 years old, still lives by herself in Cincinnati, Ohio. I want to know she got out of bed this morning and it's 10 o'clock and she's still laying in bed. I'm going to call her to find out is she okay, right? Bluetooth pill bottles, has she opened up her pill bottles to take her pills, or is she outside of her normal? So therefore, she feels like she's independent, but I kind of have a trust but verify kind of a model. Um, the fact is, is none of us want to have to be shuffled off to a, to, a health, to a facility, right, when we get older. You know, dream is, our dream of our parents, the dream of our grandparents is to age in place. So what are the technologies? So we're... We've actually been doing some work with Mayo Clinic and Cleveland Clinic, looking at remote healthcare, uh, video conferencing, so you confer with your doctor rather than having to get into a car and go to a doctor's appointment. What can I do through video? Uh, doctors and specialists. Mayo's been doing this test from Rochester, Minnesota. They've got about 75 clinics in the Minnesota, Wisconsin, North Dakota area. And the specialists are at Mayo. The, you know, general practitioners are out in the clinics, and when they need to confer with a Mayo specialist, they do it all by video call, those kinds of things. So 
but there's a lot of work yet to go. There's a new organization called West Health. Um, West Health recently got funded. It was a um, family name is, is West. I can't remember the husband and wife's name. But they donated something like $50 million to form West Health. West Health is modeled off of cable labs. Part of what we do is we do the technology work, but we also do interops and certification testing to make sure all the devices will plug together and be compatible. Part of the challenge in the healthcare industry is an MRI coming off of a GE machine is not compatible with a Philips machine. And so West Health is doing what we do for the cable industry, they're doing that for the healthcare industry. Getting standards set so that device manufacturers, whether it be a blood glucose meter, an MRI, a CAT scan, an x-ray machine, the electronic medical record systems to make sure you can exchange data, is done in a way that allows for interoperability. The biggest risk to healthcare now is, this inter is the interoperability gap. And so we've been helping West Health get up. They're doing great. Um, there's, you know, they've been around for a little over a year now. Um, but that's the kind of resourcing, kind of the new things we need to be thinking about to really transform healthcare. Okay. Yep. Do you have an opinion about IP6 when it's going to happen? Well, IPv6. I'm a big fan of IPv6. In it's fact, well, it's already happened because, in fact, Cable Labs was the interop lab for IPv6. So if you remember about a year ago and they made all the big headlines, the big switch over to IPv6, so the core backbone from the cable operators are all running IPv6 today. The biggest limitation on IPv6 is the local devices. So for those of you who are going, oh, my God, he's gone geek, you know, what does IPv6 mean? It's the next generation of your IP address, critical from the standpoint that we're running out of addresses. So each device you have, every PC, every Nest thermostat, every cell phone has an IP address. We are, we are quickly running out of IP addresses, which is, becomes a real problem when you want to add a new device and there's no IP address to give it. So IPv6 greatly expands the number of addresses that can be given to all these devices. And literally, it's like you know, 150 trillion addresses in IPv6 can be yeah. issued. Is a trillion, 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 whatever, right? And so, enough to handle all these sensors coming yes, in. that's the whole, that was the whole design of it. When uh, so Vince Cerf, who's one, him and Bob Kahn are the guys who invented Internet Protocol, right? And they defined an IPv4. Vint has been the guy leading the redesign on IPv6. Cable Labs, we did the interop testing, not only from the cable industry, but across all the devices and all of that. We did that work in our Louisville, Colorado facility. We are also an IPv logo lab. So if you want to ship something that's IPv6 certified, you can come to Cable Labs. We do the certification testing. You can put the logo on the outside of your box. Uh, we have to get there. The biggest problem is devices. If legacy devices that are in our homes, legacy de devices that are in our, in our businesses, do not know how to handle IPv6. Plus, managing an, I an IPv6 network in your home ain't easy. So Cable Labs, if you're into this space, talk to me. Cable Labs, we released into open source a project called HipNet, which is all about having IPv4 and IPv6 in a home that self-manages to really make it easy. And you'll start seeing HipNet being embedded in access points and routers that you'll be buying in retail. And that work was done at Cable Labs. Interestingly enough, it was done by three interns. Right? We gave them the challenge. They came for the summer, and they were the guys who put HipNet together. And now it's actually going to, it's now being picked up. And we license our technology royalty free. So you'll see it soon in routers and that, but that's part of the solution. But if you're interested in the space, I don't want to geek out anymore because I can get my propeller going. Um, come talk to me afterwards. Well, maybe one more question, and then we'll wrap this up. So I think the cable TV industry through its coax did a tremendous job I bandwidth possible while everybody was talking about how to get high bandwidth over there. That's a tremendous history, and now, as you say, it's about 30 megabits. But what we struggle is, is what we want to watch to make the connection, sure, it's the nearest router is 30 more megabits, but on Skype, on network, disappointing few megabits that are coming What's the solution to that? Uh, well, part of the issue is, is you know, cable plant can only handle whatever the last mile is, right? 
So part of the challenge is, is how is that service routed, right? So it starts in a data center someplace, take Skype, starts in a data server in London, comes across, lands in Virginia, then it goes to Chicago, then it finally arrives into Denver, and then it finally gets it. So it's got to actually have four or five hops before you get to it. So part of it is, is we need a redesign of what the backbone of the internet really looks like. So there's a parallel project that the internet industry is working on called Internet 2, right? It's actually up and running. It's primarily for university and government research, right? But these are like, you know, if you thought about the backbone pipe today in the internet being this big, Internet 2 is like this big. Um, and part of that research is really trying to understand what does that get you, what are the risks, management issues, those types of things. But what you're going to see is, is this, on, this growing demand for speed and for, for services is, is that there has to be a fundamental change in how the internet backbone. Because today, if you're a service provider, let's say, you know, Acme Video Streaming based in San Jose, California, and I'm going to serve you a video. The way it works today is, is I actually I buy a circuit to, let's say, level three. So I can control how big that pipe is, right? Then level three carries across the backbone, and level three says, oh, I'm going to terminate this at your house and your Comcast customer drops it onto the Comcast network, and you get it, right? So each one of those pipes, depending on how big it is and how congested it is, has the potential to have impact. And that's part of the, the challenge in the industry is what is that future of the internet going to look like because of that. Okay? Thank and with you that, much. I think we'll wrap.